Hello and welcome to Into the Woods with Holly Wharton. This podcast is all about our journey into the woods of ourselves, getting to know who we are, where we are, and where we're going in life so that we can create the life that we want to live. It's about deepening your connection with yourself, taking inspired action, and really trusting yourself and your intuition. It's also about mindset. Our beliefs are such an important part of this journey, and there are so many ways for us to change our mindset so that we can more easily live a life of expansive joy. This podcast is also about going literally into the woods and spending time in nature, and how that can help us on our own personal journey of self-knowledge. Thank you so much for joining us today. Now let's get into this week's episode. Hello, adventurers, and welcome to the Into the Woods podcast, episode 407. This is your host, Holly Wharton, and I'm back with another exciting guest. Today, I'm talking with Keith Foskett, also known as Fozzie. That's his trail name. I've read two and a half of his hiking books. I'm in the middle of one right now. One of the things that helped me to get through this last lockdown, it was kind of like having an armchair adventure when I couldn't get out and travel and and hike around the country or in other countries. So if you've ever wondered about hiking the Camino de Santiago, Pacific Crest Trail, the Appalachian Trail, or the Continental Divide Trail, this episode is for you. Even if you're not interested in hiking those trails, you'll get a feel of what it's like to do them uh, in today's episode. So we talk about the differences between the trails, what kind of preparation you need to do, and how hiking these long-distance trails can change your life. So who is Keith Foskett? Keith has hiked over 12,000 miles in recent years and has written four books about his adventures. He also contributes to various outdoor publications. What are you going to learn in this episode? We talk about how Keith managed to create a lifestyle that gives him both the time and money to travel for extended periods of time. We discuss what it's like to through-hike long-distance trails in the United States as someone who doesn't live there. We also talk about the skills and training people need to learn before they go, and it's probably a lot less than you think. We discuss the best trail for someone who has never hiked in the U.S. before. We talk about how hiking and getting outdoors has helped Keith's mental health and depression. And finally, we talk a little bit about Keith's process for writing his hiking books. Keith is the author of four books on through hiking. The Journey in Between, Through Hiking the Camino de Santiago, The Last Englishman, through hiking the Pacific Crest Trail, balancing on blue, through hiking the Appalachian Trail, and high and low, hiking away from depression. And that one is about Scotland. I have yet to read that one. I'm really looking forward to it. I have so many dreams of doing more hikes in Scotland. So without further ado, let's get into this week's episode. I hope you enjoy it as much as I did. Hello, Fozzie. How are you today? Hi, Holly. I'm good. Thank you. I'm really looking forward to this because I've read two and a half of your books. I'm halfway through one of them and uh, really enjoying your adventures. So I'm very excited to finally talk to you about this. Well, thanks for reading them. I'm sorry to say I've not read yours yet. That's okay. That's okay. (laughs) I've been kind of binge reading yours because I bought a couple of yours last year and then didn't get around to reading them. And this year I read the Camino one and then I was like, oh, I need more. And then I read the PCT one and now I'm reading the Appalachian Trail one. And so it's very exciting. I had this kind of need during lockdown to kind of get my walking fix in some way, even though I couldn't really travel very far from home. So it's kind of been satisfying my need to get out there. Well, I don't think I've I've read a lot. I mean, normally I'd read literally two or three or four books a year. But last year, I think uh, lockdown especially, um, I started reading a lot more and I'm definitely reading a lot more um, this year and enjoying it too. It's just something I've always wanted to do and never had time for and I think there's a lot of people in uh, a similar sort of situation I think a lot of people have delved into their reading in the past few months absolutely so we are here to talk about your exciting adventures around the world walking long distance trails we are Uh, you have managed to create a lifestyle that gives you both the time and the money to travel for extended periods of time. And I'm super impressed with this. So how did you manage to do this? Did you know kind of early on in your life that you wanted to have this kind of freedom or how how did you manage this? I didn't know from early on in my life that I was going to make a career out of hiking or indeed even writing. I kind of knew from maybe my late teens, early 20s, that I'd probably end up self-employed doing something. What Mm. that would be, I don't know. 
And that wasn't until I went self-employed in about 2004 as a decorator, which I did for about 12 years. And then I think it was 2015, 16, maybe something like that. Decorating had run its course and I got to the point where I absolutely detested it. Yeah. And I was just screaming to get out and do something different. And at that point, I'd written one book, I think, maybe two. And that was the only other thing I could think of to make an income from. And I guess it all boiled down to, it sounds a bit cliche, but following dreams. And I kind of listen to what my head tells me, but I always find my head will throw the logical stuff at me, whereas it's it's how you feel you know, whether it's your heart or the pit of your stomach, I think mm. generally you just kind of know if something is going to work or if you should do it. Absolutely. So I decided to stop doing decorating because it was just making me miserable. And I just dived into the books and I did kind of a lot of marketing courses the first three or four months. And I think after about literally four months, my income was better than it was as a decorator. Wow, that's excellent. So it was a decision that was that, that was a good one. So obviously I got to, to do, you know, my big love of going away for hiking for several months. And the books got to the point where they was kind of supporting me as I was going. As you probably know, to a certain extent, your books kind of take care of themselves. People buy them. It's not as if you've got a – obviously there's a lot of work writing them and that sort of thing. But generally they do their, their own thing. You have to look after them. But they'll kind of sell if you've, if you've done the right thing. So – they were basically sort of funding my hikes as I was out there doing those hikes. Mm, that's fantastic. So how did you get started hiking long distance trails? I did a little bit of kind of hiking when I was younger. My mum and my dad were not hugely outdoorsy, but they certainly encouraged me and my sister to sort of get out. So I did my first long-ish distance walk, which you're familiar with, the mm. South Downs Way. Yes, when I was, um, I think I was 15 or 16 and got to about halfway with a friend and we got absolutely annihilated by an overnight storm and had to kind of abandon ship, literally. I completed it the following year with another friend. I got into cycling for a few years, which I'm still into now, and I still went out for walks. But then my first one, the Camino, which I think was 2001, I just kind of stumbled on that after talking to a guy in a bar in Greece of all places. I was kind of heading back to England. It was August. I had a couple of months of summer left, which I didn't want to waste. And I thought I'd really want to do a long walk. And this guy, we just got talking. He said, you know, a friend that had just come back from Spain to do a, from a pilgrimage where it's called the Camino de Santiago. And I did a bit of research when I got back home. And I think the Francais route, which is basically from the French-Spanish border, to the finish in Santiago was 500 miles and I followed the route back it kind of splits into a lot of variants once you mm. get into France and I kind of followed it to a place called Le Puy en Ville Villay, which was another 500 miles so a thousand miles total and I did it and I was just hooked um, mm. I just loved it I loved the freedom uh, the people I was meeting just the lack of complications, the simplicity, you know, you just get up and you walk and then you stop and you sleep and you repeat the following day. And then I didn't do anything for about eight years. I was still hiking, but nothing long distance. And then in 2000, then I, I did the Pacific Crest Trail, mainly because I was in a position to do it because I was self-employed then and kind of doing okay. So it was just a huge dream to, you know, that was the one that ticked all the boxes. That was the epic trail of all trails did the Appalachian Trail in 2012, um, had an attempt at the Continental Divide Trail in 2014, I think it was, did about 500 miles and had to forfeit it due to medical issues. Mm. And then I think I've done the Camino another two times. Once was strictly kind of for work and the other one was just because I wanted to do it a second time. I always said I'd, I'd like to go back and do it, so I did. So did you do the whole thousand miles the second time? Yeah, I did the same route. Wow. The second time I went back, I did the same route, the same thousand miles. And then I got contacted by an American company the following year who wanted to produce an app on it. And for them to produce that app, they needed someone to hike it to A, get the GPS, the route down on GPS, and also take photos. So, you know, they had visual reminders on the app. So I went back the following year and did just the 
Spanish route, the uh, the France route, not the whole thousand miles. So mm. yeah, I've clocked up two two and a half thousand miles on the Camino, which is the same as as, as I guess a long distance hike in the States. Mm. So what was it like to through hike those trails in the States as someone who doesn't live in the US? Because the logistics must be a lot different. The logistics weren't too bad. It was a lot different in terms of the climate. Mm -hmm. So the first one, the PCT, the first, I think it's about the first 700 miles is, they refer to it as as desert. Mm -hmm. It was typical kind of desert climate. It was it was very hot. It was very dry. There wasn't much water about. I dealt with that okay because I'm okay. I don't like humidity, but if it's a dry heat, I can take it as hot as it goes. It mm. doesn't. That's I wouldn't say it doesn't bother me, but I can I can hike all day and it doesn't bother me. You know, a lot of people will they'll start at five in the morning and stop at ten, see out the heat of the day, and then start in the evening. But I just kind of went straight through because I, I seemed to deal with it okay. Mm. Um, I was terrified of bears. I was terrified <laughs> of rattlesnakes before I went out. In fact, I very nearly didn't go out just because of this insane fear of bears and what would happen if I met one. And you did. Well, I wouldn't say <laughs> met them as, you know, <laughs> sat down and shook, shook their hands and said, hey, would you like a cup of coffee? But yeah, I, I saw a few. And strangely enough, it was the same thing with the snakes. After you've seen, a, you know, maybe two, three or four, and you kind of figure out their behavior. Mm. I kind of got used to them and it was more as opposed to a scary thing. It was just a wonderful thing to see because obviously being English, we don't have bears over mm. here. I think we have a few in Europe, but the chances of seeing one of those are, are slim. So I wasn't kind of scared once I've learned, you know, how they react to us and snakes as well. I sort of got used to them. Once I got up, I was quite late on the Pacific Crest Trail, so I was up in Washington, the last state, in, in October, which was way behind everybody else. So then the snow hit, so I had mm. about two or three weeks in relatively not serious snow, but I think I remember the last day, it was kind of up to my hips, but that was a rare one. That was that was the worst day. The Appalachian Trail was almost, I wouldn't say the opposite, I was a bit, hesitant about the Appalachian Trail because it's got a re reputation for being wet, high rainfall. Mm. Um, but I think I just hiked it in a good year and there was just a handful of, of, of days when it when it rained on me. So I, I was quite lucky. And the Appalachian Trail was kind of like England. It was a lot greener. Mm. The terrain is remarkably similar to Scotland in places, especially mm. up in Maine. You've just got fast tracks of forest and these huge lakes. And it kind of follows because I, I, Scotland was attached, I think, is when before the Atlantic appeared and the continents drifted mm. apart, Scotland and Maine or that sort of area were, were the same, one and the same thing. And you can see, you can see the differences now. I've been to Scotland. It's, it's just like being in Maine and, and vice versa. So. And what was the Continental Divide Trail like? I know, I know you did kind of a portion of it, but that's kind of the big scary one that everyone says is like the most challenging, the most remote. What was that like? Yeah, if in order of kind of remoteness and where you sort of resupply, the Appalachian Trail is actually relatively easy. There's so many places you pass near or, or through that logistics are quite easy. The Pacific Crest Trail, I say, would sort of fall in between the Appalachian Trail and the Continental Divide Trail. So the Pacific Crest Trail, generally, you had five, six, seven, eight days between town stops where you can get mm. a shower, get cleaned up, get something to eat. The CDT was kind of the the remotest, and we had we did have pretty long resupplies. I think even from day one, the first one was generally most people do it in a week so seven days and then after that it pretty much followed suit you know a week was generally considered about average between stops when, when they laid that trail that was kind of like something they, they they planned I don't know I mean I was doing I think about 25 mile days so your distance between sections was about 100 to 150 miles mm -hmm. but you know if you're a superhero and you're pulling in 40 <laughs> maybe even like 45, 50 mile days, which Oof. people are doing now, you know, they kick that distance off in three days. So I was doing about 25s at the beginning. So it would have been about right for me to do seven days. But yeah, the CDT was definitely the, the remotest of those three big hikes out there. And which of the three was your favourite? Mm, I'd say a lot of people say they can't decide. Yeah. 
it seems to be a stock answer, but I mean, it was definitely the Pacific Crest Trail. Mm. I like the remoteness. I'm, I'm, I love solitude, so that didn't bother me at all. But, you know, I'm, it was kind of nice to meet people as well. And I did hike with a lot of people. So there is that social side. I liked the variety of terrain. So you get, you know, this long desert section, which mm. seems to go on for ages. And then you go up into the Sierra Nevada, which is just absolutely jaw dropping. I've never seen anything like it in my life. Really, really stunning. That went on for, I think it's about 200 miles. And then you get to the end of California and you hit Oregon, which is very much this volcanic kind mm. of rocky landscape with interspersed with forests. And you finish off in Washington with, you know, these vast tracts of, of, of forest. So you, you almost work walking through forests all the time. So the variety on the PCT was, for me, fantastic. The climate ticked a lot of boxes as well. I mean, you, you would at some point get wet on the PCT, but it's probably likely you wouldn't get rained on until you get into Oregon or Washington. And if you're finishing your hike by the end of August, you could perceivably not get rained upon at all so that wow that ticked a lot of boxes but the Appalachian Trail was tops for the social side I mean thousands of people do that every year so it's you know even if you went out there as a solo hike it's highly likely you'll latch onto a few people you click with and you know you might hike with them for a couple of days you might hike with them for a couple of months and the CDT probably scored highest for just the sheer remoteness of it mm. the sort of feeling where you think you know if I get in trouble here I'm really in trouble and yeah. that it is kind of a scary thing, but that's why a lot of people do it. It gets the adrenaline going. But if I had to nail it down, I'd say the PCT. And if I had to do one of those three again, it would be the PCT without thinking about it. Mm. And which one would you recommend to someone who has never done a long distance trail in the United States? I'd say the Appalachian. I mean, the Appalachian Trail is the most popular of the three. And I think it's because that's where most kind of aspiring long distance hikers go to cut their teeth because a the amount of people doing it so they kind of feel safe in numbers mm. and the opportunities to resupply so instead of being faced with seven to ten day sections between towns which is pretty daunting to a lot of people especially when you've got to carry seven days worth mm. of food the Appalachian Trail you could you know, it's just littered with towns and villages and cities where you can, you know, reach a road, stick a thumb out and 10 minutes to an hour later be, you know, nice and showered and fed and snoozing on a motel bed. I mean, it's certainly not easy. I mean, in fact, I found the Appalachian Trail harder physically than I did the Pacific Crest Trail. But in terms of the ease of amenities and that sort of thing, it scores highly. So that's generally, if you're going to crackle or have a go at one of the big three in the States, most people will start with the Appalachian. Hmm. And what about preparation? Because I know I've read so many books on these trails and people always say, you know, you get fit on the trail, you know, you can start at whatever level, but really you're carrying a big pack with all your food, all your supplies. It's not just like a day hike with a little day pack. You've got to have a certain level of fitness. So what kind of preparation did you do or do you recommend people doing before they attempt something like this? It's not a difficult thing to grasp. It's the same as any any sort of activity or sport where you're pushing yourself. So, for example, if you want to swim a mile, you wouldn't be inactive for three months and then jump in the sport <laughs> and, and expect to go and swim a mile. I mean, you know, some people could probably do it, but you do have to train for it. I mean, I just kind of mimic what... I'd be doing out on the trail and the, mm. the easy way to do that is to go out and hike so even if you've not done any hiking before when you're one of these long distance trails then you just start where you're comfortable if you're comfortable going out for 10 minutes every day just go and do 10 minutes and then gradually increase that distance and then maybe after four weeks when you're doing a couple of miles get a rucksack and put a, a two litre water bottle in to simulate some weight and gradually build that weight up until you get to the weight that you expect your pack to be which could be I mean, be something around five to ten eleven kilos something mm. like that and build up your distances until you're doing until you can go out in a day with a full rucksack and do 20, 20 miles is, is a good target and most people would think that's just impossible but it's not long distance hiking isn't I wouldn't say it's easy but most people can do it if they just do this training build themselves mm. up slowly your feet will get used to the distances you're walking your feet are get used to like eight kilos in your rucksack pushing down on them so your chances of getting blisters when you're actually out on the trail 
should be drastically reduced. Your hips, your skin around your hips will get used to the fact that you've been carrying a rucksack with 10 kilos in it. Your shoulders will get used to it. And you just have to sort of build your body up slowly and say, look, this is what I need you to do. And it'll react if you... Mm. It's, you know, like I say, it's the same as getting into a swimming pool. If you swim 100 meters every day for a few months and gradually build it up, you'd be able to do a mile at some point. Mm. Yeah, I think a lot of people kind of envision that distance from where they are to doing something like that. So I think it really helps to kind of have some milestones like, oh, carry your full pack for 20 miles before you go, that kind of thing. Yeah. 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 You just literally just got to mimic what you're going to end up doing and your your, your body should you know, it'll just adapt and you sh- most people should be able to do it. It's not a hugely difficult thing to do. Yeah. So what kind of budget does someone need for something like this? Because this is more than just a normal holiday. I mean, you're gone for months and months on end. What do people need to think about in terms of budget? It does vary from trail to trail. I mean, the Camino at the moment, you could probably do the Camino on 20 euros a day, which is about maybe 30 US dollars. Mm-hmm. Uh, I know you can get most of the route in Spain is dotted with uh, refugees, which most mm-hmm. people take advantage of. And it's, it's basically a bed for the night. Sometimes you might get breakfast. That'll be 10 euros. Normally, there's some sort of restaurant or bar nearby, which is doing like they call it a pilgrim's menu, which is usually cheap for them to produce. And you get some bread, you might get a bottle of wine and three courses, and that'll set you back about 10 euros. So 20 euros and then maybe another five or 10 for your food during the day, that sort of thing. I can't remember what I spent on the Pacific Crest Trail. I know when I got back, I, I nearly had a heart attack looking at my bank. <laughs> <laughs> it was a few thousand pounds. Yeah. Uh, the Appalachian was as well. I don't know. I mean, somebody said, what budget do I need to do to go and walk the Pacific Crest Trail? I'd say anything between five and ten thousand pounds, something yeah. like that. The Appalachian would be maybe slightly cheaper because it's quicker to hike. Mm. I mean, that's everything in. That's your flight. That's your insurance. That's mm. your food when you're out there. It does vary. It varies from person to person. Some people are happy with a smaller budget, yeah. you know, sub- subsist on eating nothing but pizza. Some people <laughs> want a little bit more, more luxury, that sort of thing. But it's, I mean, absolute minimum, I should think, £4,000 if you're super, super careful. Mm. How so? How far in advance do you plan? Like, do you you need to get the permit? You need to presumably get a visa to stay in the United States longer than what ninety days we get? Yes, it's been a while since I've done the PCT, but I mean, when I did us English, have to get a B two visa. If we just fly in, I think we get three months. Mm-hmm. But you have to put forward a case to the immigration. I mean, in, in theory, we can get up to three months, but that's not a dead certainty you have to explain to immigration why you want to be in the u.s for three months Mm -hmm. and it's all down to basically what mood the immigration guy is at at the the desk that's a u.s immigration is another story completely especially when it's very like and what was the question i've forgotten i think you have to apply for a permit as well to hike the trail don't you yes the permit so i'm not sure about the at i know the pct when i did it but this was 2010 we had a permit for the pacific crest trail organization which covered the entire trail so you've got a lot of national parks and regions you go through on the pct and each particular region and park had a separate permit so to save a hiker banging their head against a brick wall and trying to get in touch with all these different places the pct just has permit for the whole route when i did it as long as you weren't some sort of idiot you got it you have to answer a few basic questions and they sent your permit now it's tightened up an awful lot and there's a limited number though that they give out every year i think it's almost it's one of these scenarios where they open you know they give you a date where you can apply for your permit and it's sold out within two days oh wow it's hugely popular now. I'm not too sure about the Appalachian, but it's just got popular because through hiking in general over the last 10 years mm. has just gone through the roof. And I think books like uh, Wild, yeah. Cheryl Strayed and A Walk in the Woods, Bill Bryson, all these books and the movies as well, people have just kind of dived into it and decided that's what they want to do. So numbers have gone through the roof. I think when I did the Pacific Crest Trail in 2010, I think there was about 225 of us registered. And the last time I checked, which might have been two or three years ago, I think it was two, two and a half thousand that oh, were registered. Wow. Yeah. So it's become really, really popular. Wow. 
And what kind of skills do you need to learn? I mean, for someone who's new to this, do they need to learn how to, I don't know, build a campfire? What kinds of things do they need? Because like, I've done lots of bushcraft training and that kind of thing. So I feel like I know a lot of these things, but I think a lot of people might be stopped from going to do this because they don't know what to do, like how to set up camp, where to set up camp mm. or not to set, you know, how do you learn these things? Well, this is another thing you need to, you know, as well as gaining your fitness and getting used to the gear, this is something you need to practice before you go. Mm. So, I mean, obviously start with an overnight camping trip somewhere, yes. whether it's you know, <laughs> your local woods or whatever. And you just take the equipment that you intend using. So mm. at that point, some point, you've got to get a tent. You've got to get a some sort of sleeping pad or air mattress. You've got to get a sleeping bag. You've got to get a stove. You've got to get water filtration. And then all the kind of other gear that goes with it. So your warm jacket for the evening, maybe some camp shoes, that sort of thing. But read up on what people use. Research your gear. And then just go out and use it. It's not really rocket science. I mean, mm. a tent isn't difficult to put up. Your air mattress, you've just got to sort of blow up and put in the tent. Your sleeping bag, just check the temperature rating and also, obviously, the temperatures where you're going. It's no use buying a bag that's good to five degrees centigrade if you're going <laughs> to a place where it's going to be minus 10 degrees centigrade. <laughs> it's all kind of logical stuff, but it is scary to some people, but it's not. You know, learning how to use a stove and put a tent up, it's not difficult. I can imagine it might be a little bit daunting to start with. Mm. A lot of people just pitch it in the back garden. I mean, yeah. um, that's what I did when before my trip. I just put the tent up in the back garden and took a can of baked beans out and cooked those, had a cup <laughs> of tea, got my sleeping bag, <laughs> got up in the morning, and I thought, yeah, I can do that on top of the downs or wherever. So... Yeah, the first time I bought camping gear and all my bigger backpack and everything, I just packed it all up and I... I went hiking to this campground that's like, I don't know, 10 miles away from my house. And I hiked there and I camped and I hiked back home the next day. And that, you know, it was close enough to home where I could kind of bail if I needed to, if something didn't work, but kind of gave me that feeling of hiking with all my gear, using the gear and then hiking back. Yeah. And a campsite's a perfect spot because for a lot of people, it kind of feel a little bit more home and not, not quite so scary. Maybe yeah. there's a pub next door or something and go get a meal in the evening or... I don't know, a breakfast in the morning, but, and there's people sort of milling about. So yeah, it's a, that's a good way of doing it. Just mm. literally uh, practice what you need to do before you go. Yeah. So you talked a lot about the simplicity of being on the trail. And that's one of the things that I absolutely love as well. What else do you get out of hiking long distance trails? <sighs> I love the solitude. I'm not the sort of person that craves company. I could, I remember there was one stage on the PCT, I think I was hiking for three days and I didn't see another person, oh, which that. for some people would kind of drive them nuts. But I'm not, I'm not a hugely social person. I mean, I don't, you know, I like going out as well as the next person. But I remember thinking when I was planning it, that was another tick box of the PCT because I knew perceivably that I could go a day, maybe two days or maybe even longer without seeing anyone. And delving into this solitude thing, which which did happen, I sort of describe long distance travel as, as life organisers because you get a lot of time to just sort of get into your own head and think. So mm. if you imagine our, our normal everyday lives, you know, you get up in the morning, I don't know, you've got to get the kids to school, you go to work, you get back home, you have something to eat, you watch some TV, and we don't get any thinking time. We, people think we do, but... Mm. I mean, my thinking time when I'm working and I'm busy is kind of limited to sort of 10, 15 minutes when you're falling asleep. Yeah. And you don't really get a chance to dive into it and think about the things you want to think about. So all of a sudden you get out on these long distance trails and you think I've got five months hiking this trail. And all you have to do for eight hours during the day is just watch where you're putting your feet. Mm. And that's all you need to do. Your legs are on autopilot. So all of a sudden, you've got eight hours to think. And some people can't deal with it. They're, they're yeah. just like, I need more stimulation than this. And they, they they sort of back out. I had all this thinking time. And I kind of look back at my life back in the UK. And you have you suddenly see the things that are making you unhappy. You see the things mm. that are making you happy. You look at your relationships with other people. You look at your job. You look at your career. You look at where you live. And a lot of people, by the end of the trail, they come out with this mental list of, I don't want to do that anymore. I want to do this. I hate my job. I want to do this. 
And a lot of the time, they actually follow through with it. They'll mm. make these drastic life-changing decisions when they get back because they've had so much time to figure out what they actually wanted to do. And that was a big plus for me. I didn't realize it before I went out there. So, for example, before the Camino, this was something that I didn't realize until I was out there. And you, the Camino especially, you, a lot of people come back completely changed and totally, totally turn their, turn their life around. That was a big plus for me. And the Camino, since you've mentioned this, I really relish the solid that you even get on the South Downs Way or the Ridgeway. The yeah. Camino, I have always wanted to walk ever since I first heard about it in 1996. Haven't done it yet. One of the things that I'm kind of afraid of is that it feels like it's a super social trail and I don't necessarily want that. What are your thoughts? I mean, it is super social. I think the last time I checked the figures, I think it was something like 240,000 people oh. walked it, and that would have been from something like April through to October. Mm. I wouldn't ever class it as crowded, or certainly not when you're out walking. I mean, when you get into towns and a refuge somewhere, sometimes you'll struggle to get into places. You can get your moments of solitude. I wouldn't, if you want a hike with a lot of solitude, it would probably be the last on the list. Yeah. <laughs> A lot of people do do it because they like that that social aspect. They like the safety in numbers. It makes yeah. an ideal, perfect hike because there are a lot of people doing it. Hmm. Yeah, and that yeah. probably is a good first trail for a lot of people because of that social aspect. Yeah, exactly. One of the common questions you see on, on hiking forums is, I'm, I'm a solo hiker, I'm single, and I'm really hesitant to go out and do the Camino or the Appalachian Trail. They've kind of asked a few friends and it's obviously not easy to take a few months up to go and do these sites. So that they're faced with the prospect of going out there alone, especially on the Camino. And the, the question is, will I be OK? Mm. And, you know, I mean, I read so many of them and, you know, within probably a day of landing and getting to St. Jean Peter Port, which is the start of the Camino. I know that those people within a day will probably have two, three, four, five friends by the time they finished it. <laughs> They would have lost count of the amount of friends they've uh, they've made. So being a solo hiker going out is probably the perfect position. So a lot of people do it with friends, and it, it strains even yeah. sometimes it strains even the the closest of friendships. So often it's a good idea just to go out there on your own and make friends. Yeah, that's exactly what I've heard. I've read yeah. so many stories about people going with friends or partners or family, and it's not gone how they expected. Yeah, sometimes it's not a good idea, especially, I mean, can you imagine that on a six-month hike in the States? Oh, yeah, that will put stress on any relationship. <laughs> yeah, whereas if you've gone out there on your own, I mean, I, I'd, I'd hate to say you can pick and choose your friends. I wouldn't go that far, but, you know, if you get to figure out pretty quickly the people you click with and mm -hmm. the people you think, yeah, I'm not too sure about them, and you kind of sort of blend into different sort of friendships, and it works fairly well. Hmm. Someday, soon, hopefully. Uh, so you've written a book called High and Low, Hiking Away from Depression. Can you tell us a little bit about how hiking has helped your mental health? It's not hiking in itself. It's kind of, there's a lot of associated factors along with the hiking. So I know for a fact physical exercise helps my depression, which is why I hike. I know fresh air helps my depression, mm. which I'm experiencing when I'm hiking. Sunlight helps my depression. A little bit of solitude helps my depression. A lot of people might raise surprises, at, you know, solitude being good. But for me, it's, it does help. Meditation helps with depression. And I don't sort of sit down and watch a burning candle for half an hour when I meditate. I do it when I'm hiking. It's just a lot of collective things rolled into one that hiking kind of encompasses. Four or five reasons. And they all they all help. Hmm. Yeah. I've been talking a little bit more about mental health lately, just because I found this last lockdown here in England to be really challenging. And thankfully, I was able to kind of get out and do my walks and my trail runs and that kind of thing. And I think that really, really helped. But there were some difficult times in this last lockdown. And so I'm kind of wanting to have this conversation with people more and more about how they use outdoor adventures to manage their mental health. It's been a difficult time for a lot of people. I think a lot of people have got depression and they don't realise it. I didn't realise I had depression. And when I first realised, even as recently as 2015, there was still a huge stigma around depression. Mm. People just didn't admit it because they thought there was something wrong with them. And obviously the fact that people can't, haven't been able to get out during most of last year, 2020, and most of this year already, 21, 
it's bound to affect people's mental health, being cooped up all day, not being able to see friends and family, not being able to go out and socialise, being restricted on where you can go, what you can do. Mm. It was bound to sort of create havoc with a lot of people. And unfortunately, it did. Hopefully now we are coming out of a permanent basis. It, it kind of remains to be seen. But yeah, I don't think it's not one of those things that I sort of thought about at the be- beginning of, of lockdown and a lot of other people thought about that mental health would be a factor that it was. But when you think about it, it's the situation we've been put in, it's bound to affect a lot of people. And unfortunately, it has. Hmm. Yeah, and it's thrown people out of their rhythms and their habits and their everything that they were used to. So it's like, you know, maybe they had this system that was keeping them functioning and holding everything together. But it, all that was thrown out the window. So it's like they no longer had their coping mechanisms or support or all the normal things. So I think it just really rattled a lot of people. Yeah. Yeah. Like I say, hopefully it's, um, it's, it's, we're on the upward, upward trend when we're coming out of it. So fingers crossed. So how else has hiking long distance trails changed your life? Uh, It helped. I mean, when I got back from the Camino, going back to, you know these these thought process and all this this time to think that was a life changer because i just i i got back with all these ideas of what i wanted to do writing was was one of them so that was kind of bubbling away in the background but when i got back from the camino all those decisions had been made i wasn't it's not something i wanted to mess around with anymore i just went out and did it and that's when uh i wrote the first book so essentially that changed my career mm. uh, the first hike and especially the Camino you do out of all the trails it's that's the one that does seem to seem to change people so it gave me sounds a bit of a cliche I suppose but it, it just gave me the strength to follow those plans and those dreams that I wanted to do and up until doing that hike and thinking about them I didn't feel I had the strength to follow them through because it's a mm. scary thing to do yeah. Yeah. So, so can we talk a little bit about how you write your books? Because some of my listeners are also working on their own books about walking and hiking adventures. So do you keep a journal along the way and then use that for the books or what's your process? For me, it was it was all memory joggers. So wow. you come back with six months of, of sort of memories. You can't remember everything. Some things are more vivid than others. Some things you've completely forgotten. So for me... I mean, I had, I knew when I went to do the Camino for the first time that I thought I could possibly write a book when I got back. And I knew that to do that, I'd need a lot of visuals and a lot of notes. So Mm. I just wrote a diary every day. Sometimes that diary was half a page of A4. Sometimes it was two lines. Sometimes it was, it was five pages. Uh, and to do that, I I had a dictaphone with me at the time. This is before smartphones, so I just had a little tape recorder. And, and as I walked during the day, if something or a thought came into my mind, which I think would, would, would go down well in the book, then I just dictated it. And at the end of the day, I had all these uh, dictated notes, which I just wrote up uh, in the diary. So I came back with just like pages and pages and pages of of my Camino in words. Um, and I took photos as well, um, so I had uh, visual memory joggers. And once you, instead of getting back and trying to remember it all, you've got all these pages of notes and all the memories sort of come flooding back and the notes mm. lead on to other areas I, I, I decided to write about. But, I mean, that was the first book I never... I never trained as a writer. A lot of people would probably argue that that's um, <laughs> uh, a fair point. Um, but it's an I excellent just... book. I mean, it tells your story. It it, gets, it brings the reader to the trail. Like I, I loved it. I mean, you know, it doesn't have to be fancy literature to be a good book. You're very sweet. Thank you. That's. I just wanted to write write something that was that wasn't complicated, that was, wasn't was deep, wasn't mysterious, wasn't complicated, just something that, you know, anyone from, say, like 10 years old up to 90 could, <laughs> could kind of read. And, uh, you know, luckily it's done, it, it's done well. I didn't know, I didn't know how it would do something 
something said write a book there was just kind of a, a feeling somewhere that it's something I should do and it's it was a good decision so mm. I'm just I'm, I'm pleased people buy it I'm pleased people people enjoy it and and how did you manage to build kind of a following around your books like what's worked for you in terms of marketing and getting people to actually buy your books the the few marketing courses I took um, a lot of them were at the time and even still now were, were pushing uh, a subscriber list, like a mailing mm, list. Yeah. So let's say a lot of people might write a, write a short book and give it away for free in exchange for an email address and a, you know someone's name. Um, and you every week just sort of send out an email to these people uh, obviously something you've got to make it interesting you're going to make it funny make it exciting so you know people enjoy reading it yeah. and once you build this this list up um a few writers i know it goes into you know 10 20 30 thousand readers and the theory behind it is when you write a new book or bring a new book out uh, you've got this big possible um uh, customer base mm. already there because you know they subscribe they what they're interested in what you're doing so if you release a new book um you should sell a few i never it's 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 successful for a lot of people i don't i do have a subscriber list i don't do an awful lot to sort of increase it because for me i remember when i did re release subsequent books i didn't really get an awful lot of sales from them so it mm. that was a huge thing for me but it does work yeah a lot of people that's one thing you can do um a decent website's obviously a, yes. a must a blog is obviously a must um podcasts like you've been doing is is the last year and a half especially with lockdown that's that's pretty popular as well mm. uh, active social media active twitter active facebook and instagram which is very visual obviously so that's kind of you can show your adventures yeah you can yeah, yeah. So what are the next adventures that you've got planned or what are your kind of dream trails or what's on your list? I, well, I kind of, I say kind of, I still, I still, well, I have made my mind up. I quit. I made the decision to quit through hiking Ooh. 2019. I went out to do a Camino route from Seville in South Spain up to Santiago. I think it's about 600 miles. And I got about 250 miles in, and as as your head does, just started firing questions of as whether this is something I wanted to do anymore. And I kind of thought about it for a bit, and I came home came home after about 250 miles because I decided I, it was as simple as I didn't want to through hike anymore. It's something mm. I'd done, I loved it, but it just wasn't. Um, it wasn't sparking the imagination anymore. I wasn't having a bad time, mm -hmm. you know. It wasn't like a, a you know, the, the the trip from hell or anything. I was having a nice time. I was walking in sunshine all day. I was drinking Spanish wine, and I was having a nice time. But it was just kind of gotten to the point where I thought, do you really want to do this anymore? Are you really getting excited about it? And I, I just answered honestly, and I wasn't. So. Since 2019, I haven't really planned, obviously, any more long distance hikes because it's not something I want to do. But I changed my mind like the weather, Holly. So <laughs> you know, we could be talking in two weeks' time and I'm making plans to go and do another attempt on the Continental Divide Trail. I don't know. Um, I'm more into my bikes at the moment. Um, I've ridden since, I don't know, <clears throat> my first bike when I was five or six. And I've done some cycle touring in the past. I did a, a five week trip round France and Switzerland last year in between lockdowns, which I loved. Mm. Uh, so possibly some, some long distance hikes. I've got a friend and we're planning to do the Silk Road, which is for those that don't haven't heard of the Silk Road or the Silk Route. It's an old trading route between China and Istanbul bull in Ooh. turkey um i'm not too sure of the distance i know it's several months um and i know that my friend then posed the question that if we're riding to china from china to istanbul we might as well ride from istanbul back to back to england <laughs> um, i think this one's about this prop this one's about eight years away um 
It's kind of like, you know, an early retirement thing, not that uh, I'm that old or anything. But <laughs> uh, So, yeah, I'm more kind of geared around cy- cy- cycling, but I'm still hiking. I mean, I'm, I'm just waiting for a decent break in the weather. I go and do my annual South Downs Way hike, which I've done, nice. except for last year because of lockdown. I've done for, I think, eight, nine years or something like that. Wow. I do it every year. It's just, you know, uh, the first sign of relatively warm dry weather mm-hmm. and i've just got you know a week out hiking doing something i love so i still do the shorter hikes just not the not the longer ones mm. and how do you do the south downs where do you wild camp where what do you do i normally wild camp it um i treat myself to a hotel either at the start or at the finish and i used to get the train back from Eastbourne or Winchester or wherever I finished back home because I live I used to live in Sussex I live down in the New Forest now but I used to live in Sussex Mm. Um, now I tend to leave the car at one end so I'd probably leave the car in uh, Eastbourne and then get the train back to Winchester so the car's at the end I Mm. always found it was easier getting into a car yeah. knowing you've just got the simplicity of driving back home as opposed to getting a train back you know which is going to take four hours which is the last thing you want to do when you're you've just done 100 miles but i normally if i pick the weather right i normally don't even bother picking the, the tent up so i'll, I'll, I'll quick pick a, a secluded spot in a wood just put a ground mat down and sleep in the open air which is something i love doing mm. See, Go on. I've always wanted to do that, but I just, like, I'm so afraid of getting asked to move on um, since wild camping is, you know, technically legal in England. Have you ever had problems getting asked to move? Not on the South Downs way. It is, the laws are a bit, fun. I mean, they're pretty clear in England. I think you have to basically ask the landowner's yeah. permission, which is just, it's a crazy rule because you just, you don't know who owns the land. Yeah. And <laughs> nobody's, nobody's going to, stop at seven in the evening you think i'll camp here and, and go off walking out all the farm you're saying do you by chance happen to to know or own that bit of land up there and if you do can i camp there it just doesn't happen I know. so this is why people wild camp yeah and obviously as long as you follow the basic rules and, and the number one is always you know leave no trace you yeah. leave that camping spot as you found it um I years ago I sometimes I'd have, have I'd have a fire. That's something not 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 something I do now. There's just too many. Uh, it's kind of becoming frowned upon. It's, mm. it's it's acceptable in the states, but this country it's generally frowned upon. Um, and I advise sort of going off trail. So I'd yeah. normally do it in woodland. I prefer woodland because if, if you get a damp night, you tend to stay dry. If you're out in a field, you just get soaked in dew. Yeah. But if you're in the wood, it kind of settles on the tree so you don't get so damp. Um, and just, you know, get away from the trail and don't don't make it obvious. Don't, you know, take don't take your bright red tent and, and put <laughs> it 10 feet from the trail and have a blazing bonfire with a, <laughs> you know, your boombox rattling out at 2 o'clock in the morning. You've got to be somewhere on the trail where if somebody walked past you they'd have no idea that you're there yeah that's a good uh, way of looking at it yeah good good well i'll have to uh take the risk <laughs> yeah a lot of people do a lot of people do. Oh. i think it's, it's generally it's 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 I, it, it's strictly illegal but it's it's one of those it's one of those areas that you know as long as you're sensible it's yeah. it's, it's 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 fine it's acceptable all right. Well, that may be one of my next adventures for this year. So, Fozzie, where can people find you online and learn more about your books and what you do? Website is probably the easiest bet, which is just my name, keithfoskett.com. I'm on Twitter on Keith Foskett. I'm on Facebook on Keith Foskett. And my books currently are all exclusive on Amazon. So there is five books. They're all on ebook. They're all on paperback. Most of them are on the hardback and they're all on audiobook as well. So it's Ooh. all exclusive on Amazon, audible. I'm hoping it might change later on in the year and I want to get them out on other platforms such as uh, Kobo and mm. these places where people go that isn't Amazon. So yeah. iBooks and all the other places hopefully later on in the year. But for the moment, it's Amazon. Sounds like a plan. Well, thank you so mm. much for joining us today. 
That's all right. Thanks for asking me. I had a good time. Thank you. Great. Please drop me a line and let me know what you thought about this week's episode. You can email me at holly at hollywharton.com or find me online and get in touch there. People seem to be messaging me on Instagram a lot lately, so I'm getting better at checking the messages there. <laughs> I used to be terrible about it, so feel free to message me wherever you find me online. My contact page on my website was not working for a while. It's working again now, so if that wasn't working for you, you can message me there. Thank you so much for listening to this podcast. If you enjoyed this episode, if you enjoy it, the podcast in general, please take a couple of minutes to leave a quick review on Apple Podcasts or wherever you listen to podcasts. It would mean the world to me. And remember to visit hollywarden.com forward slash 407 for the show notes on this episode. One thing I forgot to mention before I sign off, Keith and I and some other writers are going to be doing um, a another promotion of our hiking books like we did last year. So we're going to be doing probably a free promotion of all of our hiking books towards the end of the month in May. So stay tuned for that. I will hopefully have more of those authors in the upcoming weeks on the podcast. That's the plan. We still got to get it in the calendar. So stay tuned for free hiking books at the end of the month. I will be sure to promote that on social media and the podcast and all the places I hang out online. So finally, I'm done. Have a fantastic week. Happy trails to you and enjoy the outdoors. Thanks so much for listening to Into the Woods with Holly Wharton. You can find more information about today's episode, including links for topics that were discussed, at hollywharton.com. That's H-O-L-L-Y-W-O-R-T-O-N.com. If you'd like to connect with other listeners and get support on your journey, I would love for you to join my private community on Patreon. That's patreon.com forward slash Holly Wharton. That's p-a-t-r-e-o-n dot com forward slash Holly Wharton. Thank you so much for listening, and I look forward to seeing you next week.